His friends and colleagues will discuss Shaman, the man and the economist, his legacy and vision for a South Asian economic union and the way forward for the regional cooperation agenda. Each speaker is encouraged to focus on one area of cooperation that someone championed. We would like to thank Dr. Dusni Virakun, Executive Director at Institute of Policy Studies of Sri Lanka, Colombo, for moderating this session. Uh, sincere thanks to Professor Rehman Sovan, Chairman at Center for Policy Dialogue, Bangladesh, for providing the keynote speech. And special thanks to panelists, which include Professor Mustafizur Rehman, Dr. Abid Kayum Suleri, Dr. Postraj Pandey, and Dr. Nagesh Kumar. Without further ado, I request Dr. Dusni Virakun to facilitate this session. Thank you. Thank you, and uh, good afternoon, and welcome back to this final plenary session. First of all, I want to uh, convey our thanks on behalf of the Institute of Policy Studies to Porsche and Sorti team, the co-organizers and partners of SAIS for dedicating this um, special session in honor of Dr. Saman Kalegama, former executive director of the IPS. It was mentioned, I think, um, by many speakers at the outset that um, SAIS was kick-started by um, Saman in 2008 in Colombo, and he attended each of the subsequent summits very diligently, and his absence here at the 10th SAIS is being felt very acutely from all the personal um, conversations that I've had with the participants. We used to, um, we were very heartened when we received a, a flood of condolence messages and tributes at the um, untimely death of uh, Dr. Kedegama in June 23rd this year from all across, all around the world, but most especially from um, South Asia. Those were heartfelt messages, and I think they offered a great deal of comfort to his wife and his two children to know that someone was so well regarded, respected, and held with great affection um, away from Sri Lanka as well. We used to joke that whenever he catches a flight to Dhaka or Delhi or Islamabad, Kathmandu, or any of the other South Asian capitals, that he's uh, visiting one of his hometowns. And that is because he was so very comfortable and relaxed in many of the South Asian capitals than he was ever in Colombo, I think. So it is, um, gives me a great deal of um, pleasure to be sharing this um, panel with a collective of his close friends from the South Asian region. And the topic of uh, this session also, on way forward for regional um, integration agenda, I think he was very passionate and committed to the idea of South Asian integration. And it's not an exaggeration to say that he's perhaps the only Sri Lankan scholar that held on to his commitment to um, South Asian economic integration. So his absence um, in the policy circles in Colombo, I think will be felt equally in South Asia as well. To map his journey as a young researcher and to a leading intellectual thinker, a South Asian thinker, there is no one more qualified to speak about that journey than Professor Raymond Suban. So it gives me great pleasure to invite Professor Raymond Suban to deliver the keynote speech, after which the panelists will themselves reflect on their interactions with someone over the last two and a half decades. Professor Suban.
Dushni and old friends of Saman, Kaligama. Uh, I must at the outset uh, apologize that uh, uh, after I make my presentation, I will have to leave in order to navigate the traffic and try to catch a plane back to Dhaka. Uh, so uh, I feel bad about this, but please bear with me. I have, in fact, actually uh, uh, prepared a paper, which I titled Saman Kalegama, a tribute to a citizen of South Asia, uh, which uh, I think may have been circulated electronically. This is a world I'm not familiar with, but uh, some of you may see. But I will be making my presentation based on that. It is, even today, difficult for me to absorb the sad reality that Saman Kalegama will not be making his quiet presence felt at size 10. Over our long years of association, he was not only a respected professional colleague, but became a treasured friend. For me, as for many of you here, his untimely departure remains a personal loss. Saman will be remembered by all of us as one of the founding fathers of the South Asia Economic Summit, SAIS. He laid the groundwork by organizing the very first SAIS at Colombo in 2008, which I attended with some of you present here. Since that auspicious inaugural, Saman has, to the best of my knowledge, attended every SAIS across South Asia, including the second SAIS convened by him at Colombo in 2013. Yet to relect, recollect Saman's low-key presence and, and understated communication skills, it would be difficult for an unknowing newcomer to the size process uh, to take note of the fact that this youthful-looking, modest personality who never raised his voice, even when he spoke publicly, was the ideologue and also the man of action behind these heroic events. I choose to contextualize Saman's memory within the size process because he's been my partner on our South Asian safari ever since he took over as the executive director of the Institute of Policy Studies in 1995. I've been engaged in the process of conceptualizing and constructing a South Asian community since the late 1970s, when Sardar Talok Singh, possibly the godfather of the idea of con uh, the community, brought together a number of research institutions across South Asia to constitute the Committee for Studies on Cooperation and Development in South Asia. Uh, South, uh, the CSCD, as it was known, was eventually succeeded by the Coalition for Action on South Asian Cooperation, which became another network of scholars rather than institutions. Uh, some of us continued on this journey, and it was over here that, in fact, we, uh, after Saman took over, he became active in the South Asian process through Kasak in undertaking work on South Asian economic cooperation. I first encountered him in various South Asian dialogues organized by Kasak and was deeply impressed by the high level of professional competence of this modest young man, his quiet dependability to take on research challenges, and his commitment to the mission of building a South Asian community. When we moved to set up the South Asian Center for Policy Studies in 1999 as an attempt to institutionalize all these various initiatives, I persuaded my colleagues who were invited to the foundation meeting at CPD in Dhaka to also invite Saman to join our board so we could draw in someone from a younger generation to join us in the task of building South Asia as he led an organization with a very strong research capacity for similar reasons of enhancing 
SESEP's research capacity. We uh, drew in Nagesh Kumar to join our board, drawing on the available strengths of the RIS. Over the next 17 years, through our various interactions at SESEPs and other South Asia-centric fora, I continue to be deeply impressed by Saman's sincere commitment to the idea of constructing a South Asian community. In his association with SESEPs and in other initiatives related to South Asia, Saman drew on his exceptional capabilities as a development economist, uh, his organizational skills, and his complete dependability to carry through any task to which he committed himself or IPS. Among the many who joined our odyssey towards South Asia, Saman appeared to be one of the few who sustained his faith in the enterprise. He demonstrated his commitment through the, his diligence as a researcher, his creative ideas, and research leadership, whereby he built up a strong body of work identifying both the problems as well as opportunities for cooperation within the region. In the process, he inspired a generation of younger colleagues led by Dushni Virakun to develop a strong research capacity on South Asian issues within IPS. Saman also built a strong working relationship with his peers at RIS, Swati, SDPI, and Islamabad, and CPD to carry on the tradition of keeping abreast of the challenges facing South Asia and identifying possible solutions. Now that he has left us, the present generation will miss the natural leadership provided by Saman, who not only constituted a bridge between generations, but carried over some of the passion of the pioneers who committed themselves to building a South Asian community. While all of you assembled here, who constitute the institutional partnership with sustained size, have demonstrated impressive research skills, uh, you need to invest your skills with the same degree of passion and commitment which Saman brought to the mission. This is even more important today than it was at any time during the four, last four decades, because the very idea of a South Asian community is receding. Today, the member governments of SARC, particularly its larger members, appear to have lost faith in the regional entity which brought them together and are looking towards alternative regional groupings, both within and beyond South Asia. The move away from SARC, in my experience, is not altogether uh, new, and we have, in fact, lived through this process. It now and then, as we experience then and today, it requires more than research skills projected at periodic conferences. It needs sustainable engagement. In my view, the idea of South Asia can only be kept alive if it remains embedded in your professional concerns and institutional priorities. Saman demonstrated his commitment through the untiring persistence which drove his substantive body of work on South Asian concerns. As executive director of SASEPS, I personally benefited from Saman's valuable contribution to our mission. Uh, through the SASEPS task force, he co-chaired with Muchkun Dube on the implications of building a South Asian free trade area based on research carried out at IPS and the CPD SASEPS work on challenging the injustice of poverty in South Asia, where Ganga, I think she's here, in fact, actually uh, uh, performed excellent work in producing a report for us. But all these represented Saman's commitment to the process and ensuring that whatever obligations he took on were done on time. He was also one of the founding partners in the editorship of the South Asia Journal. Saman had the good fortune to have his research leadership and skills recognized and appreciated by his own government, where successive regimes drew upon his services to provide papers and guidance over a period of two decades to Sri Lanka's position on various economic issues related to South Asia. Uh, 
Among many such tasks, Saman was seconded by his government to serve on, and, on the second Sark Commission on Poverty Alleviation, which he eventually chaired. As a result, Saman had always served as a valuable link between official and civil society in South Asia. As a regular member of Sri Lanka's delegation to various Sark summits, he was an important conduit for delivering policy input from SASEPs and perhaps size to the Sark summit deliberations. Savan's pioneering role in the conception and operationalization of the size process uh, evolved out of his extended engagement with the idea of constructing a South Asian community. The size process was conceived by Saman, drawing, drawing on his association with SASEPs. In the early days of SASEPs, when I was its ED, the board had conceived of the idea of initiating a uh, SASEPs project to establish a South Asian Davos. We had imaginatively thought of locating this project in the Maldives island of Bandos and had been assured by our board member, Ibrahim Zaki, then a senior minister of the Maldives government, of the full support of his president and government for the project. A number of feasibility studies were carried out for the idea, which even involved the CII in India. Sadly, the project languished due to our inability to mobilize resources uh, to underwrite a South Asian bandos and the changing fortunes of our Maldives partners. It was Saman's idea to reconceptualize the idea of a South Asia Davos on a more modest, manageable scale where selected partner institutions would convene an annual summit in their respective countries, which would, as in Davos, bring together governmental leaders, senior business persons, and civil society leaders from across South Asia to collectively discuss the current challenges facing the region and to share ideas on how to promote greater cooperation. Saman demonstrated the doability of his more scaled down project, which precluded the need for accumulating the large capital investment needed to construct a permanent base in Bandos for a South Asia divorce. Instead, he established that each partner institution would assume the more manageable responsibility of mobilizing resources needed to convene an annual summit. In this endeavor, of course, he drew on all his partner institutions who still remain part of the process. The size partners were all led by capable researchers of Saman's generation, each backed up by well-established institutions with strong professional and organizational capability. By organizing a high-level, well-organized first summit at Colombo, Saman demonstrated that his organization could successfully implement such a Herculean task. He thereby presented a challenge to each of the prospective partners to match his pioneering effort. History notes that the size partners have commendably responded to Saman's challenge, and we are now attending the 10th size summit at Kathmandu. Each of the partner institutions have now managed to host two such well-attended South Asian events. All of you assembled here should take pride in the sustainability of the size process, which began its journey in Colombo a decade ago through the commitment of Safan to take up the charge, challenge of launching the first summit. It is only fitting that the 10th summit should serve as an epitaph on Saman's life and work. It also provides us with an occasion to pay tribute, not just to his bold initiative, but to his contribution to the ideas which underlie the size process. It is important for all of us assembled here to ensure that the size process not only survives the loss of one of its most committed founders, but it can also withstand the inclement winds which threaten to capsize the SARC process. The most enduring tribute that all of you assembled here at size 10 can pay to the memory of Saman Kalegama is to not just persevere with size, but to absorb more of Saman's passion and commitment 
towards building a South Asian community, which can transcend the fluctuating fortunes of the SARC process and continue to nurture deeper roots with sustaining cooperation within the peoples of South Asia. Uh, thank you, and as I said, I leave now with a deep sense of hurt at Saman's passing and sadness that I cannot uh, be here to hear the rest of you, but I will be with you in spirit. Thank you, uh, Professor Saban, for that wonderful tribute. Thank you. I will take up the tribute. I think um, Professor Saban touched on all the milestones of uh, someone's journey in promoting regional integration in South Asia. Started off with energy as a young researcher and enthusiasm. Um, and here we are. In 2017, um, with much of the discussion at the uh, SAIS being about the next steps of regional integration. In that context, um, I want to bring the panelists in. Um, when we talk about the future of the regional integration agenda that someone worked on uh, for two and a half decades, In uh, mapping the uh, way forward for regional um, integration agenda, um, I think the cross-section of the South Asian countries represented here all have differing um, strategies and challenges. If I take Bangladesh, it's one of the better performing economies. It has been growing at over 6% for about a decade. It's balancing its relations with China and India. China has committed 15 billion um, dollars um, as loan commitments in 2016. India, I think, if I'm not mistaken, has offered 5 billion in loan commitments quite recently. Bangladesh has duty-free access to uh, India through the SAFTA agreement, and now it's starting um, trade negotiations with Sri Lanka on a bilateral FTA. But I'm sure underpinning all that, there is um, tensions in the domestic uh, political uh, sphere in Bangladesh about how to position itself in the um, regional integration project in South Asia. Similarly, in India, there is speculation in some quarters that India has a SARC minus one um, agenda, and there is an issue of um, image problems. Um, I think in the plenary session, it was mentioned that um, India, Sri Lanka FTA is one of the few successors of um, South Asian um, cooperation. But if someone were here, he would tell you the challenges that he faced and the pressure that he was under in negotiating um, on the uh, ECTA as well as on the previous SEPA agreement due to domestic um, lobby against um, further economic integration between uh, Sri Lanka and India. Similarly, in um, Nepal, I think in the uh, plenary session, uh, Swani mentioned that Nepal is diversifying its strategic um, relations, inviting China in to develop its um, infrastructure while they attempt to repair their relations with um, India. And in Pakistan, um, Pakistan is quite, I think, um, focused on the China-Pakistan economic corridor. There are questions whether Pakistan has any real interest in, in South Asian integration. So the whole narrative and discussion of South Asian economic integration, I think, has changed considerably um, from the time that someone as a young researcher jumped in um, enthusiastically into this project uh, in the early 1990s. In the work that he did, 
whether it is on bilateral FTAs or in the um, regional um, FTA process or at the multilateral level, trying to find common um, South Asian position, he has been interacting with all the um, panelists here for more than two decades. So I would um, invite the panelists to also tell us through those conversations that they had with someone, the areas on which they agreed. I'm sure there were divergences of uh, opinion as well in the approaches that um, were being adopted. If I take Sri Lanka as an example, someone was a lead negotiator for Sri Lanka in the last two years on bilateral FTAs with India, China, Singapore. And the message very clearly from the government is that Sri Lanka is looking beyond South Asia and focusing on um, East Asia. And its only interest in South Asia was really India. So with all this fragmentation and competing um, strategic interests, I'm sure there are interesting um, stories to be told about how we now move forward in pushing this um, regional integration agenda forward. So let me invite Mustafiz to kick off um, and come in on Bangladesh's approach and his reflections on someone's work and how that has also um, helped shape the narrative. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Chair. Uh, personally, it is very difficult for me to uh, talk about someone in the past tense. Uh, he was a very close friend of ours over the last 20 years and more. We have been working very closely and uh, we were very close personal friends. This is the first size that we are doing without Saman and all the next size we'll have to do without him. So that's the tragedy. Uh, I think uh, uh, Professor Raymond Soban has uh, very succinctly captured uh, the, uh, all the achievements that uh, Saman had in his young life. And I think uh, if, if for me, uh, if I capture what Professor Rahman, Rahman Sohan wanted to transmit, he was one of the finest economists of our generation. He was a fine scholar. He was an institution builder, and our best wishes will be with uh, Dushni as she takes up the mantle of Saman at IPS Colombo. And he was, I think, one of the distinctive features of Saman was that he blended scholarship with policy making. Uh, as distinct from many of us, Saman was very closely involved uh, with uh, Sri Lanka's uh, trade policy making. He was very uh, intensely involved in the uh, Comprehensive Economic Partnership Agreement, the, and before that, the Bilateral Free Trade Agreement. He was uh, also a member of the Technical Committee, which was uh, negotiating the free trade agreements of uh, Sri Lanka with other countries, including Bangladesh. In fact, when I uh, met uh, Saman in June, in fact, I uh, spent uh, the last two days of Saman's life. Uh, uh, we were in, uh, in Bangkok uh, for the uh, seminar organized by ESCAP on inclusive uh, RTS. Uh, and I think that uh, really also resonates with the theme that we have. And we have, uh, we have discussed some, but not uh, discussed, I think, enough uh, with regard to uh, inclusiveness of what we are talking about. And uh, we had some sessions here on employment implications of uh, you know, South Asian integration. I think that also captures some of it. Uh, but um, in those last two days when uh, Saman suddenly passed away uh, in Bangkok and uh, we, we um, uh, talked for the last time in the in the in the in the evening, and uh, I think as Dushni has uh, mentioned, I think you see uh, regional integration has its winners and perhaps also losers if you look at at the short term. And someone was telling me uh, what the he was under tremendous pressure from various best vested interests when he was negotiating what items will be in the sensitive list 
what items will be you know, sequenced and paged later on in the uh, tariff uh, liberalization programs. So there were a lot of pressure on, on, on him. But I think that if you are really just not blocked down into, bogged down into academic exercises, but would, would also uh, like to be involved in policy making, I think those are the pressures that one will have to, you know, it comes with the terrain. Uh, but uh, but I think he was, uh, and he was uh, sharing with me that he was under tremendous uh, pressure from various uh, various groups. So uh, that is something that uh, that we have to take in uh, into consideration. That when you talk about the South Asian integration, uh, and uh, how do you really you know phase the phasing of it, the sequencing of it, the pacing of it? All these are very practical questions, and all these have very important practical implications for various vested interest groups. So how do you navigate? Someone used to distinguish between two types of you know, integration. He used to tell that, you see, there is regionalization and there is regionalism. You know, regionalization takes place when you liberalize. You know, neighboring countries tend to uh, take advantage of it, and, and we have seen it. But regionalism is a conscious policy. And that conscious policy you'll have to pursue with evidence-based, you know, uh, um, your facts and figures and uh, how do you really envisage. Uh, Professor Eman Suban was uh, one of the key uh, architects of the group of eminent person report, which he was also mentioning uh, yesterday, uh, which uh, envisaged a South Asian economic union in 20 years. Uh, the preferential trading arrangements, then the free trade area, customs union, common market, and then economic union. So the, in 20 years. And we are now in 2017, and we know that it is not happening. But if there was to be another group of eminent person, and that eminent person group was to be mandated, to how do this say next 20 years? What are the current challenges? I think that's what is also very important as we have come through an experience. Uh, we are nowhere near the economic union that the group of economic eminent uh, uh, persons thought of. But what are the major current challenges? I think that the, the reality which is there and in the various sessions the, this uh, came out. Uh, one issue is that perhaps we will have to have building blocks in order to have South Asian integration. There are sub-regional initiatives which are uh, very good, and Dushni has mentioned about Indo, uh, uh, Indo Bangladesh uh, uh, connectivity uh, projects which are going on. Uh, we had the first line of credit of $1 billion, then the second line of credit of $2 billion, and the third line of credit, which was uh, um, signed just a month back, uh, of $5 billion. So these are very important projects which will connect uh, uh, Bangladesh with, 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 with India. And then some of these projects will also be part of the BBIN. And, and if Bhutan comes later on, then the three countries, Bangladesh, Nepal, and India, can, we, will go forward. And some of these projects will be integrated, these connectivity projects. Uh, uh, I think one, in, in many of Saman's writings, what we see is that trade in connectivity depends on three other connectivities. It is the transport connectivity, it is the investment connectivity and then the people-to-people -people connectivity. Without those three, trade connectivity will not take place. So one of the major lessons that I have learned from his writing is, is that con transport connectivity and then driven by that investment connectivity is very important. And I think we can do that, those with conscious policy choices, which I have mentioned just a few minutes back. And uh, if we look at, for example, Bangladesh, we are now envisaging 100 special economic zones. Uh, work on, f uh, on 10 of these uh, have already uh, made some progress. And two of the economic zones will be dedicated to Indian investment. Now, if you have good connectivity, and then if you have those you know, conscious policy choices to stimulate investment, I think that is the way that we can get into the regional market, and also into the value chains. And these value chains, as Professor Raymond rightly yesterday mentioned, that China is the major trading partner of all individual SAC countries. But SAC countries are not trading much among them. I think very insightful observation. So if that be the case, then you get into also the 
sub-regional value chains, including the Chinese value chains. India has bilateral signed bilateral FTA with ASEAN. So there is, this is also an opportunity to take, taking advantage of those investment projects which are coming, the connectivity projects that are being implemented to get into those value chains. So I don't see that these are mutually exclusive. These can be complementary and we can take advantage of that. I think along with South Asian integration, we should also now think about Southern Asian integration with China being an important component of it, I think, and the, and, and, and the East Asian countries and the ASEAN countries. So, so South Asian countries, we are passing through very important you know, uh, phases. M many of the South Asian countries, for example, Bangladesh, Bhutan, Nepal, they will be graduating from the least developed status. It's only a matter of six, seven years. You know, we are envisaging that in 2018, Bangladesh, Bhutan, and Nepal will be considered for graduation, and after two triennial reviews, they will become non-LDCs. So the international support mechanism, market access, et cetera, zero tariff, what we are getting now, those will not be there. So where you will have those advantages, which will allow you to translate your competitive advantages into competitive advantages? It is reducing the cost of doing business, and getting into the value chain. So I think that this is very important that we take this into consideration. Many of our countries will also have also graduated like Bangladesh from low income countries to lower middle income countries. But after having graduated, we have seen many countries uh, in, in Latin America and also in, in, in Asia have fallen into middle income trap. And if you want to come out of those trap and sustain accelerated growth that we are experiencing, it is very important that we also collaborate with, for example, ASEAN, where many of the countries have fallen into middle income trap. We have just graduated into middle income. So we have complementarities, and that can also help us. And the connectivity and in investment are the two key, I think, uh, issues uh, which are there. So as I uh, recall uh, um, my last conversation with, uh, with Saman, um, uh, it was, as I said, it was inclusive RTAs. So that is also very important. We, we sometimes uh, talk about intra-regional trade. I think that we have to also go deeper into it. If, I, if the, if the intra-regional trade is in beetle leaf, it has one implication. If you are getting into a value chain like, for example, ready-made garments, if you are importing cotton, that is one implication. But if you are importing, for example, fabrics, that is another integration. If you are importing cotton, then in your country, you can have more job in spinning, weaving, you know, yarn, fabrics, ready-made garments, garmenting. So I think that the value chain and getting into the value chain is very important. And where are you pitching into the value chain is also very important from the perspective of inclusive growth. And uh, all our, in our, all our countries, we are facing the challenges of Know, taking advantage of the demographic dividend. For example, in my own country, our median age is only 23. So, but we already have a large percentage of the young people who are educated, but untrained and unemployed. This is a very toxic combination. And we are also seeing rising inequality. For example, when Bangladesh, which was a lot poor in 1972, when we uh, liberated our country, at that time, the Gini coefficient was only 0 0.32. In 2010, it was 0 0.45. The last household income and expenditure survey showed in 2016 data is 0 0.48. So inequality is also increasing. But we are also growing and average, averages, average income is, is growing. So how to make regional trading arrangements more inclusive? I think that is something which worried Someone when I met him, you know, for the last time, and I think that is something that should also worry us. And uh, I think that uh, we should have regional integration, but let us also think how the small and medium enterprises benefit from there, how the low-income people benefit from that, how it is, you know, income augmenting and 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 employment generating. I think those should also be the issue. So distribution of the value along the value chain is also of importance. And that is what uh, I think uh, Saman would have talked about had he been here, but uh, he is not here. And uh, I think that uh, the best uh, that we can do is, is that um, these are progressive ideas. These are ideas which uh, we all, I think, over here, all of us, we adhere to. And uh, if we can 
translate those ideas, I think it will be a regionally integrated South Asia, but not only regionally integrated, but also integrated in a way which is uh, distributively justified, justice, uh, there will be there, it will be inclusive regional integration. So that is the sort of integration we all uh, want to, and that will be the best legacy that we can have from someone's teachings. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Mr. Fees. Uh, your main argument, I think, being that uh, the various strands of integration that we see in the South Asian region should be treated as um, building blocks, and that uh, there are complementary processes that are taking place with the involvement of uh, China, etc. But we should stay focused on connectivity that looks at transport, investment, and people, and above all, to ensure that that integration process is inclusive. Let me uh, call on Dr. Abid Suleri, Executive Director, SDPI, Pakistan, for his comments. Uh, thank you, uh, Dushni. Uh, good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, first of all, my apologies. I was not able to join the first two days of uh, this very important uh, summit. And actually, I had uh, very little intentions to join uh, until I saw in the program my name written in uh, Saman Gama's uh, special session. And two weeks ago, when I met uh, uh, with Nagesh in his office in Bangkok, uh, this is exactly what uh, both of us would discuss. So, uh, I told Nagesh that I found myself in a panel uh, in uh, memory and in honor of uh, Saman. And uh, now I would have to. Uh, join and I would have to come. So yes, last night I was uh, in COP23 in Germany. So yesterday I flew from Germany to Kathmandu uh, to be part of this panel. And uh, this is just my personal attachment and uh, uh, personal uh, uh, respect uh, uh, to the gentleman we are discussing uh, about. But uh, it is not only my feeling or my institution's feeling. This is uh, uh, what we felt we feel about him in Pakistan, and this is uh, uh, how uh, we actually uh, felt that it was Pakistan's loss, it was South Asia's loss, uh, region's loss, uh, when we heard uh, the news of uh, uh, his uh, very untimely and uh, uh, sudden uh, demise. Uh, South Asia Economic Summit, of course, is uh, one of uh, the legacy uh, of uh, someone, uh, something uh, that we need to continue. And I remember that uh, at, uh, after every uh, summit, few of us, uh, and we know uh, most of the participants, the delegates, so few of us uh, who used to say that uh, this regional integration would never happen, so it is wastage of money, time, and resources, and perhaps uh, we should not continue with this uh, exercise. And I know someone's uh, pet response uh, used to be that if it is such a futile exercise, uh, why you are here? So uh, the proof that you are here and you want to attend it, uh, it means that uh, you, you haven't uh, given up and uh, you still have faith and trust that this region collectively uh, can work together. Uh, and I think uh, this is the spirit uh, through which uh, we organize uh, the, the summit. Now talking of uh, the way forward, and I think uh, any of uh, the way forward uh, uh, would be based on the current realities, uh, perceptions, uh, and uh, uh, the some uh, things on ground. So uh, without endorsing or challenging uh, those perception and realities, uh, I think one thing, academically speaking, that we need to see is that uh, this uh, regional integration process and SARC process, it is stalled. And uh, it is stalled, uh, basically, uh, from my uh, understanding and my reading, uh, due to four uh, countries in the region, uh, which is Pakistan, which is India, which is Bangladesh, which is Afghanistan. Uh, all of the four, uh, they have some sort of uh, tensions, problems, lack of trust, disputes uh, among each other, and uh, this is not letting uh, SARC and uh, regional integration go anywhere. So let me start with the easiest one, which is uh, India and Pakistan. So of course, between India and Pakistan, there are some perceptions, uh, there are some uh, realities. Uh, unfinished agenda of partition, uh, this is uh, one of the issues. Kashmir keeps on coming again and again. Uh, uh, it is uh, uh, halting and it is stalling uh, the process. 
the acquisition of infiltration uh, that, uh, from both sides, uh, that is again uh, comes up in all sort of negotiation and it takes away those negotiations, whether that infiltration, uh, the acquisition to uh, Pakistan, that it is supporting uh, uh, this uh, sort of unrest in Indian administrated Kashmir or Pakistan, the acquisition that India is supporting this unrest in Balochistan. Uh, and that also leads to cross-border uh, firing. Uh, but then it also, uh, the good aspect of uh, this uh, India-Pakistan relation is that uh, firing and uh, trade, uh, the exchange of commodities and exchange of uh, uh, gun shots, it continues. So you could see uh, trade happening across the uh, Vaga border and you see uh, gun shots being exchanged uh, around uh, the border. So uh, that is uh, a reality. Similarly, when one looks at Afghanistan and Pakistan, uh, it is uh, again uh, not only the uh, transition trade issue that Pakistan was not giving uh, uh, land uh, transition to Afghanistan to go to India, but it's uh, also again the mutual uh, tit for tat acquisition for infiltration on both sides, and it's also about the border violations, and it's also about uh, the cross-border uh, firing uh, that is hampering uh, any regional progress. Uh, in case of Pakistan and Bangladesh, like Pakistan and India, unfortunately, uh, there are uh, still uh, sizable uh, uh, segments of uh, society uh, which are uh, facing this dilemma of post-partition identity and post-partition recognition. So uh, we need to understand and we need to accept that there are three independent states in the region now, uh, and uh, all three of them, they have uh, the uh, sovereign rights. Uh, and uh, not only in the four countries, Nepal and India, they also face some irritants. We know that uh, uh, the supply of uh, fuel oil and petroleum uh, to Nepal, uh, it can be uh, choked and it can be blocked any time by India. So this is the region uh, in which we are trying to uh, work. But uh, uh, life doesn't stop and life has to uh, move on. So uh, despite uh, these bottlenecks that I mentioned, uh, one can uh, find these realignments that are taking place. Uh, one can see that there are uh, new alliances uh, that are uh, taking place. Uh, SARC uh, uh, conference couldn't take place, but then we see that uh, BBIN is uh, working uh, and flourishing. Uh, and of course, this motor vehicle agreement, despite that uh, in Kathmandu conference, Pakistan was not uh, uh, agree, uh, was, was not ready. I want to use the word uh, agree. Pakistan was not ready, but uh, BBIN uh, shows that how uh, the countries in the region, they can uh, move on if uh, they want to work together. Uh, similarly, uh, the Chabahar port in Iran, uh, that is, uh, again, tells us that uh, uh, India uh, and Afghanistan, they can still keep on uh, uh, trading, uh, uh, minus uh, Pakistan, so they can use this uh, Iran's route uh, if uh, uh, they want to. Uh, now, uh, looking uh, at uh, uh, some uh, international al alignments here, so uh, US and India, they are getting closer to each other. Uh, and uh, Russia, whose entry as observer to SARC, uh, which was uh, supported uh, by India at one point of time, uh, is now engaging uh, with military exercises in Pakistan. And uh, Pakistan that lost uh, two generations uh, as a, a proxy war uh, for America, disintegration of uh, USSR. Uh, because Pakistan never wanted to give access to USSR uh, to the uh, Indian Ocean, uh, is now uh, asking, and uh, Russia is asking Pakistan, and Pakistan is reciprocating that uh, in Pakistan and Russia, they can be partners in CPEC, uh, which is uh, Gwadar port and Indian Ocean and uh, all other. So the point I'm trying to make that uh, uh, among states, uh, I and uh, uh, Raj Pandey, we can be permanent friends or we can be permanent foes, but uh, the states, uh, they have their own interests to take care of, and uh, uh, even within our lifetime, we can we are uh, observing uh, this ty type of realignments where uh, uh, friends of past are uh, foes of uh, uh, present now, and the foes of past are now uh, deep friends. Uh, few uh, till few months ago, no one could have imagined that uh, uh, Pakistan would refu start refusing visas to American citizens, and uh, uh, rather Stimson Center, uh, you, most of you uh, must have known. Uh, a team of Stimson Center that was visiting Pakistan, their visas were revoked after uh, issuing. So Pakistan is showing its uh, muscles to America and telling them that uh, we don't, uh, we are no more dependent on you. So uh, this is uh, the reality in which this region has to uh, work. And uh, uh, of course, 
uh, than the entry of China. So you may uh, say that uh, China, it's a uh, uh, new uh, colonization, it is colonizing, uh, but whatever it is, uh, uh, China is uh, uh, very much uh, there, and of course, uh, CPEC, uh, the China-Pakistan Economic Corridor Project, uh, uh, that is there. But uh, after presenting these two uh, pieces of jigsaw puzzle, let me come back to uh, South Asia again. So all of us, uh, most of us, we are South Asians uh, here, and in South Asia, there is a common tradition uh, which is very uh, much common in Pakistan, and I'm sure uh, you will also uh, endorse me that it's uh, uh, in other countries as well. So in South Asia, we have disputes uh, among and between families and friends. And in normal times, we don't want to meet uh, each other, uh, the families, relatives, the friends uh, with whom we uh, don't uh, not have uh, good terms. But the moment there is a tragedy in the family, uh, the moment there is any bad news, all of the friends and all of the family members, they will get together. So even, uh, and sometime I questioned myself until I started realizing that how important it is for regional uh, integration. So I used to uh, question uh, myself that uh, what is the fun of uh, going to someone's condolence uh, if we were not willing to meet him or her at uh, his or her lifetime. Uh, but uh, since the person is no more there, now we are going there and we are uh, uh, telling the family members that how grieved uh, we uh, felt uh, due to his or her departure. But this is very South Asian culture, and uh, uh, this is uh, perhaps uh, all the most uh, reason that uh, we need to work together. So uh, we are, South Asia is not uh, passing through a usual time. We are passing through a very unusual uh, time. And uh, uh, of course, uh, uh, there are certain uh, uh, circumstances, there are certain issues on which we have to uh, work uh, together. Uh, I will start with smog, uh, very common phenomenon uh, in Delhi and in Indian Pakistan part uh, of Punjab, but it is uh, the very uh, common phenomenon in Lahore and Pakistani part of Punjab as well. So life gets halted due to smog, fog and smoke, the air pollution. Uh, so it is uh, very much there. And of course, no single country can deal with it uh, on its uh, own. Uh, we are looking at sea level uh, rise. So it's not that uh, Maldives would get affected uh, from it only. Dhaka and uh, Karachi and Mumbai and Colombo, all of uh, uh, these uh, uh, ocean cities, uh, th they would get affected uh, uh, equally. Uh, we are talking of Himalayan glacier melting, which is uh, the uh, reservoir for uh, this region's water. Uh, and if uh, this melting would happen, Bangladesh, Afghanistan, Pakistan, Nepal, India, Bhutan, all of us, uh, we would suffer uh, equally. Uh, we are talking of uh, water scarcity. All of us were facing uh, uh, this at equally. On social issues, uh, uh, the trade uh, and exports from all countries, they would get equally affected if we didn't address our labor issues, if we didn't uh, address our environmental issues, if we didn't uh, address our uh, human rights issues. Uh, SDG uh, would still uh, be a problem and the region uh, would collectively lose if we uh, couldn't uh, uh, take care of uh, SDGs. Uh, rising inequality, uh, Dr. Mustafi just mentioned, uh, so despite economic growth, it is, uh, it's still a major problem. So for all of these problems, uh, we need to uh, work together and uh, towards end, uh, and uh, talking of uh, way forward, I think uh, uh, we need to uh, uh, think of uh, the problem first and the problem is lack of trust uh, among our nations and among our governments. And uh, uh, we sitting here, it's our responsibility uh, to uh, flourish uh, that trust. Uh, it's the media's responsibility, it's academia's responsibility. Uh, if Bollywood is a bonding factor in South Asia now, if it's Indian curry and Bollywood, uh, that is a, uh, a common uh, bonding factor. So we need to perhaps use this uh, instrument. Uh, we need to use academia. When we say that South Asia is the youngest nation, looking at uh, the uh, population of youngsters, so we need to uh, leave a good narrative uh, to them, and that narrative building is our uh, collective uh, responsibility. Uh, size, when we talk of size, and of course, uh, when tra track one doesn't work, that's where track uh, one and a half and track two, uh, those are required. Uh, you must have uh, seen a picture a uh, few weeks ago. Uh, former uh, chief of ISI and former chief of PRO, they were delivering a lecture in London, and uh, they were uh, uh, having, it was a, a very warm uh, hug that uh, they were uh, giving to each other, and uh, there was a big caption, uh, uh, best spies are the former spies. So, so of course, the best diplomats are the former diplomats, and best spies are the former spies, and best journals are the former journals, and this is the collective responsibility of uh, all of us to uh, 
uh, use uh, those uh, sympathetic uh, uh, forces uh, to uh, engage them in uh, such forums uh, so that this forum is not only a g gathering of uh, think tanks or uh, policy makers, but also a gathering of those who have uh, years uh, uh, of uh, policy makers <coughs> back home uh, so that they can influence the process. And I'm sure all of us who are sitting here, we have our own uh, uh, some sphere of influence uh, to whom we can influence and we can definitely uh, keep uh, uh, moving uh, forward. Uh, and uh, then we have to think of uh, uh, forging issue-specific alliance. So if SARC is not moving somewhere, so if South Asia is not moving somewhere, so perhaps we shouldn't use the name Sa SARC disaster uh, management trust or SARC disaster management thing, but we can still use the issue. So we need to have uh, uh, this uh, collective in joint research on uh, issue which is issue specific and the issues which are common to us. And uh, finally, uh, while I'm uh, skeptic about, uh, I have my reservation, if not skeptic, about China's uh, investment coming to uh, Pakistan, uh, but I think China is a common denominator in the region now. China, if one looks at uh, China's FDI uh, in 2015 to South Asia, it is uh, more than $6 billion. India's FDI in the region is $114 million. Uh, so China is, uh, uh, by all means, uh, has its influence uh, in the region. Uh, China is investing in Pakistan. It's investing in India much more than what it is investing in Pakistan. Uh, it is investing in Nepal, it is investing in Bangladesh, it is investing in Afghanistan, it is investing in Iran. So it looks to me that uh, uh, it would be a common denominator and perhaps uh, uh, being part of uh, this region, China would start influencing. Uh, till now, China's strategy, which was different from American strategy, was that China never interfered in the local politics and the local issues, uh, while American they uh, used to do, and very soon friends from India, they will find out uh, with the handshake uh, with America that how it will uh, uh, influence. But uh, China so far hasn't uh, uh, influenced, but very soon it would start influencing China too. And uh, perhaps uh, being a, uh, born optimistic, I feel that uh, it would have a leverage uh, to bring all these countries uh, uh, on a common table because it won't let its investment, massive investment, uh, uh, go on a, a risk uh, uh, due to the internal disputes of uh, uh, this region. So uh, one uh, is uh, passing through a very interesting time and one should be optimistic that uh, the coming times they would be not even more interesting but uh, more positive. And uh, this is the spirit uh, I think that Saman Kalagama uh, lived uh, his uh, life and uh, we should continue uh, the spirit that all of us at our individual level, we have to con contribute towards this positive narrative building. And this positive narrative building, I'm sure that our uh, if not in our lifetime, our next generation, they will definitely uh, see a very different kind of South Asia. Thank you very much. The domestic and international um, conflicts, how they are being realigned, but uh, you also highlighted areas that South Asia can focus on uh, where it needs to um, cooperate in terms of addressing the environmental issues, but most importantly, building um, trust amongst the um, different uh, countries that are undergoing bilateral conflicts right now. Uh, let me invite um, Dr. Poshraj Pandey. Okay. Thank you, Dushini. Distinguished participants. I, I, I think some I mean, it's my privilege and to say something in this special session in memory of shaman and particularly on behalf of Saudi, its member, its staff and its partner organization. In fact, shaman was 
a friend of Salty. And for some of my colleagues in Salty, he was a guide, he was a mentor. And he was always I mean, thinking of how to promote regional cooperation in South Asia. And I still remember when he read a book, Termites in Trading System, how much he was disturbed. In fact, I mean, he had conviction on that regional group as a building block rather than a stumbling block for global cooperation. And when we meet you, I mean, maybe in many various uh, occasions, in the various seminars and conference, he always I mean, used to talk about regional cooperation in South Asia and, and also the South Asia Economic Summit. And in fact, he was one of the architect of the South Asia Economic Summit. And I must I mean, inform you that the concept paper we have circulated for this 10th South Asia Economic Summit, someone has contributed. And we had, we had discussion on the concept, on the theme of the South Asia Economic Summit, maybe in the first quarter of this year. And for me, I mean, dear Professor Raymond Soban, he said he was a bridge in two generations, my generation and his generation. But I must add, he was a bridge between policymaker, expert intelligentsia, and private sector. When I was negotiating for Nepal's WTO membership, he always reminded me, I mean, every nation should grasp the strength and weakness in negotiation. And after that, you have to identify the negotiating position. But identification of negotiating position is not the sole responsibility of a state. You should take into confidence the researcher, the private sector, the civil society and all the stakeholders and you have to have dialogue and discussion with the stakeholders at various levels. In fact, he was a silent revolutionary and who has contributed in changing the way policy are formulated and implemented and the way negotiating positions are defined. Okay, here I just want to I mean, touch upon one issue which is very much interest of someone and I think I mean, that, is, that is minimally discussed over here. That is the trade in services and also satis, shark agreement and trade in services. Well, I mean, he wasn't satisfied, or rather I would say I mean, he was dissatisfied with the way the service trade negotiation was taking place in Shark after we signed that satisfaction agreement. And we had a many round of discussion, Shaman and myself, and we agreed the critical role of services in economy-wide and farm-level efficiency. Okay, so let me highlight I mean, some of the issues I mean, we discussed, particularly with regard to the service negotiation. And more or less, we agreed I mean, on this thing. Maybe, I mean, I just highlight two, three issues. First, that is the negotiation modalities. I mean, currently the negotiating modality is 
request and offer by member countries based on WTO commitments. But I mean, we agreed this our offer request and offer modalities won't take anywhere this service negotiation. The reason being, first, the level of commitments of the SARC member countries and WTO is not uniform. Nepal and Afghanistan has made extensive commitment. Bangladesh and Maldives, they have very minimum commitment and Pakistan and India, these two are in between. So here if you start negotiation with asymmetric base, then the outcome will be asymmetrical. And, and it would be very difficult for the negotiator to accept that asymmetrical outcome. So we need to change this offer and request modalities of negotiation and, made, and we need to opt for sector-specific and modalities. That is, we need to identify the sector which are beneficial for South Asian countries. For example, tourism, for example, ICT, or for example, energy. And we can negotiate to liberalize those sectors so that all the I mean, member states benefit and out of this negotiation. That was one, our I mean, common standing, common position. And the second was on the rules of origin. I mean, it would be unfair if negotiated preferences are exploited by the free riders. That's the reason we have rules of origin, provision in uh, goods agreement, and also in service agreement. And maybe some, maybe one and a half years back, Shaman and Maishan Sami, because we are quite disturbed to know the directives of government of India to purchase cross-border power. And that direct Indian directive states that in order to qualify to export to India, it has either to be, I mean, majority of the share, that is 51% share, should be either of the Indian government entity or Indian private sector or the public entity of the exporting country. So, I mean, that kind of provision, if we, we have that kind of provision in our service agreements, that's not going to promote any services in South Asian countries. So, we need to have some uh, provision that, that helps to promote any services in member states. And another was basically and trade, service trade facilitations. I mean, we need to incorporate some provision and service trade facilitation. And also we, we, we need to promote regional value chain in services. I mean, we, we, we agreed I mean, on, on these issues. And with this brief reflection on our position, basically on trading services, I conclude my tribute to Shaman a researcher, a policy thinker, and an institution builder. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you, Khosh. You touched on some of the complexities of services-related uh, negotiations. The asymmetric nature of uh, negotiations based on offer request um, modalities as well as problems of rules of origin. I think someone was very much involved in services uh, um, negotiations under the uh, bilateral agreement with um, India. Let me now invite Dr. Nagesh Kumar, Director of the so Social Development Division of UNSCAP in Bangkok. Thank you, Dushni. Let me begin by thanking the organizers uh, to give me this opportunity to say a few words in honor of 
my uh, very dear uh, friend H, he was uh, of any one of uh, this audience, um, Saman Kelegama. I uh, especially uh, want to uh, use this occasion to uh, pay tributes to him on behalf of uh, UNSCAP, uh, where we drew upon his expertise in various uh, programs of, uh, of ASCAP. And uh, personally, I have been, of course, uh, a privilege, uh, uh, I had the privilege of working with him closely uh, in my previous capacity as uh, Director General of RIS before joining ASCAP. And that uh, collaboration and close working relationship continued throughout uh, uh, even after I moved to UNSCAP in 2009. Uh, I got to know uh, Saman uh, in, uh, in 1991 uh, when I began uh, working on a feasibility study of Indo-Sri Indo Lanka bilateral free trade agreement, which eventually uh, was implemented, uh, uh, was signed in 1998 and implemented from year 2000. And uh, ever since I got to know him, um, we developed a very good uh, and very close, uh, uh, you know, uh, collaboration and partnership, uh, which uh, resulted in a number of uh, joint uh, studies and products. And uh, Simon was described by my fellow panelists as a great institution builder and someone who uh, had an abiding faith in the uh, regional economic integration, especially in South Asian contacts. Professor Rahman Soban earlier described his contribution to a uh, you know, number of institutions which were created over time to promote regional economic integration in South Asia, including SASEPs, including this very summit where we are all having meeting space uh, to discuss and advocate some of these issues. But one of the things uh, which I uh, worked with him uh, and uh, uh, had the pri uh, privilege and pleasure of working with him closely was uh, South Asia Economic Journal, which we uh, uh, founded in uh, or launched in 2000 and it continues to grow from strength to strength and now is uh, uh, rated as uh, one of the top uh, economic journals on the region and uh, attracts uh, submissions from uh, scholars from around the world, is abstracted in jail. And this was uh, basically a vision, uh, you know, someone had to uh, provide a forum to South Asian researchers and any researchers working on South Asia to uh, give them a platform which is uh, recognized uh, as one of the best uh, anywhere in the world. And uh, he sort of uh, asked me to join him in, in that uh, initiative. And, uh, you know, uh, he remained till his uh, very end, uh, highly committed to that uh, institution, uh, which uh, you know uh, we built together. So I think there are many, many institutions that were uh, you know created uh, by Salmon in his different incarnations in different places. And uh, if you begin talking to every one of this audience you will come up with many others, uh, in other initiatives that are not uh, very much, uh, you know, sort of publicly known uh, where Simon played a role in directly or indirectly. So I think uh, it is a very big loss to uh, be without Simon Kelegama in uh, South Asia. And uh, it will take many decades uh, for us to come to terms with, with his loss. And personally, I feel a void uh, in my mind when I realize at the end of any day that uh, someone is no more. I can't pick up the phone and talk to him 
as I used to, I had become uh, used to uh, talking to him on any issue that uh, one faced and seek his advice. So let me also uh, take this opportunity to uh, say, f say a few words on the substantive discussion that uh, this session is having on the way forward for regional uh, economic integration in South Asia. And uh, over the past uh, three days, we have heard a number of uh, uh, very erudite uh, presentations and, and thoughtful uh, discussions. And uh, one of the uh, ling lingering uh, uh, you know, things which comes out of all of these is the frustration that we all share with the South Asian economic integration not achieving its potential. I mean, I'm sure uh, a lot is happening, but a lot more could happen, which is not happening. And that frustration, everyone uh, in this room share. So uh, I have been just thinking aloud uh, on what uh, could be done. And, uh, you know, uh, because, uh, uh, you know, uh, the regional economic integration has assumed a new criticality in this age of the post-global financial crisis world. We all know that uh, China and some of the uh, other East Asian economies grew very fast by becoming, uh, you know, manufacturing basis for uh, uh, the Western world, uh, the uh, United States and Europe, which were consuming uh, far more uh, than uh, their means and uh, even uh, borrowing and consuming. And that in that process, uh, they created a lot of demand for manufactured goods and services from Asian countries. And uh, countries like China benefited from that. Uh, but that process came to a grinding halt, if you like, uh, in uh, 2008 with the uh, collapse of Lehman Brothers and world economy since then has not recovered to the uh, the expanding uh, world trade which was supporting this Asia dynamism before that uh, crisis is stuck. So we are uh, aware, we know that uh, world trade used to grow between 2003 to 2008 at 12 to 15 percent kind of annual growth growth rate. Now uh, you consider yourself lucky if it is growing at 3 percent uh, per annum. So I think the world has changed uh, since 2008. And the writing on the wall is very clear that the way uh, China and other East Asian economies were able to build their uh, industry uh, growing upon or benefiting from very fast growth of uh, uh, the world trade and benefiting from that global economic integration is not going to happen again. And South Asia doesn't have that opportunity which was available to uh, China and other East Asian economies. So, uh, so what Dutch uh, it tell us? It tells us that uh, fortunately uh, Asia uh, as a continent uh, is, is still growing at a pretty decent rate, not the kind of rates that we had got used to in the pre-crisis period, but it is still growing. And, and because global economic integration with the Western world, now that demand has come, come down, is not uh, uh, anymore a, a, such a uh, tantalizing pro uh, possibility, regional economic integration has assumed a new criticality. If we have to look at, uh, you know, an engine of growth uh, for, for us, uh, it has to be not global economic integration, but regional economic integration. So on top of all the regions that Professor Deepak Nair yesterday had in his keynote address, on the relevance of uh, regional economic integration for South Asia, I think this is one more which is uh, to be added that uh, it has assumed a new criticality in the post-global financial crisis world. Now, how do you uh, pursue regional economic integration with the kind of uh, uh, you know, 
situation that prevails in South Asia with the SAC process coming to or is stuck. Uh, and uh, in, in any case, in the best of the times of SARC, it has proceeded in a very halted, haltingly ma uh, halting manner. Uh, one step forwards and sometimes two steps backwards. In the best of its times, uh, you know, uh, some very sensible ideas and proposals were stuck. Motor Vehicles Agreement, for instance, in Kathmandu Summit, it was ready for signatures, uh, but was, was not uh, adopted. The Railways Agreement was ready for signatures in 2014, was not adopted. The Investment Agreement has been in discussion for forever, and last, uh, you know, maybe 10, 10 years. The Services Agreement was signed, the SATIS, in 2010, uh, but one has hardly seen any requests and offers which would make that agreement as meaningful exercise in liberalization, and SAFTA, a lot has been talked about. So in the best of the times, I think uh, SARC has not lived up to the expectations or its potential as a driver of regional economic integration in South Asia. So what does one do? So I would like to submit one uh, you know, thing, which is that there are limitations of sub-regional cooperation, sub-regional economic cooperation as we are trying to pursue in South Asia. Uh, and by the way, ASEAN, which is touted as the great s success story of regional economic integration, was very much in the same fate as SARC is today, until 1998 East Asian crisis struck. That was one period which showed to the leaders of uh, ASEAN, uh, or highlighted the uh, regional economic interdependence of those ASEAN countries uh, to each other, because uh, the, uh, you know, the way a crisis is spread from one country to the other, uh, you know, contagion, uh, they realize that they uh, have to hold together, otherwise they all uh, perish. So that was the time when uh, ASEAN Free Trade Agreement, which was moving on very slowly, the way SAFTA proceeds, was uh, speeded up suddenly. They, tried, they started to uh, uh, prepone, not postpone, prepone the implementation schedules. And uh, from 2015, it was brought down to 2008. Uh, and so I think uh, the East Asian crisis uh, pushed ASEAN integration uh, very, very significantly. Uh, and in other uh, sub-regions, ECO, for instance, is another grouping in the neighborhood, which has also been proceeding very, very uh, slowly, if at all. So I think there are issues that hold back uh, uh, the sub-regional cooperation uh, because sibling rivalries, uh, to use the term, uh, uh, you know, which uh, was very often used by a Singaporean diplomat, uh, of Pani, the sibling rivalry which affected, for instance, uh, Malaysia, Singapore kind of relations are the fact of life. We need to recognize that there, so there will be some tensions between uh, immediate neighbors, uh, whether they are border-related uh, issues or some other political tensions. So they, they hold back pro progress. There are also other issues of complementarities being there, but not as profound as you will find between distant subregions like South Asia and East Asia you see the complementarity suddenly becoming so much more profound. Uh, one region short of labor and uh, very abundant in capital. Another region, South Asia, abundant in uh, labor uh, with the demographic dividend and all uh, other things, and short of capital. So uh, the complementarities are there at sub-regional level, but much more profoundly uh, in the distant uh, distant subregions than uh, the within the subregions themselves. So while there is a huge potential of regional cooperation 
within South Asia, and all different proposals and dis issues that we have been discussing for years, connectivity, energy cooperation, uh, regional public goods for uh, you know, keeping uh, or addressing the cha uh, climate change and all other things, we need to do and we should uh, pursue them and uh, howsoever slow and whatever can be done to expedite them, consolidate the progress and all that should be done. But I think we need to pursue another layer of uh, uh, regional economic integration at a broader level, which is beyond uh, the uh, sub-regional integration. And that is where I think uh, we should look at the Asia-Pacific region as a broader region and what opportunities are, exist there of uh, cooperating with uh, the uh, you know, next door uh, neighbors uh, and sub-regions like East Asia, like ASEAN, like Central Asian republics and, and try to build a, an overarching architecture of harnessing the, those opportunities through an Asian economic community. Now, what are the, uh, the uh, possibilities of doing that? I think there are two uh, very important possibilities. One is to hook up with uh, the ASEAN plus processes. ASEAN, uh, besides integrating their own uh, economies of, you know, 10 economies, they are also working with six other dialogue partners, which include China, Japan, Korea, India, Australia, and New Zealand, to build a broader regional uh, trade agreement. This is called RCEP, Regional Comprehensive Economic Partnership of East Asian Countries. And these 16, when they take off as a single market, it would be a huge, mind-blowing kind of, uh, you know, uh, 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 regional trading arrangement or regional economic uh, grouping uh, of the caliber or stature of EU or uh, NAFTA, if you like. And, uh, you know, so, but fortunately, uh, the RCEP architecture is built on uh, the basis that a, there is an ex open accession clause so other countries can join. So it could be uh, one uh, way that other countries begin to think about joining RCEP and make it an RCEP plus plus, and uh, Asia, you know, uh, begins to integrate in a uh, broader manner. And the advantage of uh, broader regionalism, I should also add, is that uh, in a larger setting, some of the bilateral uh, rivalries or sensitivities which hold back progress, will not be able to hold back uh, that, uh, you know, kind of, uh, they will not get stuck because of one country or two countries blocking the progress. So, uh, so I think this is something we need to begin to uh, look into. And so RCEP is one route. The other route is, the uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, the uh, most universal framework or forum in Asia is, is of course, ASCAP, and uh, which uh, uni unites or brings together 53 uh, member countries of, of the region. And, and as member states of ASCAP, you can uh, always ask uh, ASCAP to drive this agenda. Of course, there is some process uh, happening in ASCAP framework, and uh, Excellency, the Vice Chairman of NPC, uh, Dr. Wagle is going to chair uh, the ministerial uh, in, to, uh, in, in, in a week's time uh, from now. This is the second ministerial on regional economic cooperation and integration in ASCAP framework. So I think member states have the power to drive this agenda in, in of regional economic integration using the platform of ASCAP. So that is another. And ASCAP platform is talking uh, of a four-pillared approach. One is the market integration, one is the seamless connectivity, the third is financial cooperation to, uh, to generate resources for infrastructure deficits, and the fourth is to build regional public goods to address shared vulnerabilities like climate change, energy security, food security, and all that. So I think uh, I would like to just close on that uh, with these words. I want to uh, 
uh, pay my personal tributes and on behalf of ASCAP uh, uh, tributes to uh, the memory of uh, Saman Kelegama, uh, who, uh, whose loss uh, this subregion really uh, cannot feel for a very long time. Thank you very much. Thank you, uh, Nagesh. I think you touched on uh, the an alternative route that uh, South Asian countries can look at beyond the regional, uh, sub-regional cooperation that you would call it that, to a broader um, integration process that's taking place through the RCEP um, and ASEAN plus six plus, as well as uh, uh, potentially linking up with initiatives under the SCAP. We have about 10 minutes left and I'm sure Posh and his team are very keen to wind up. They have put in a lot of hard work to get us here on stage. Um, in the 10 minutes that we, are, we have, um, I'd just like to uh, open up to any, I know there are so many of uh, someone's friends here, anybody wants to um, make some personal um, contributions. Um, we will just leave the question and answer out and just leave with that. Let me start with Ratnaka and um, uh, Thank you very much for providing this opportunity. Um, this is uh, this was really heartbreaking for all of us. I mean, when I heard the news uh, from Prabir, they must be here, and then uh, it was heartbreaking for uh, not only for one reason but several reasons. Uh, and someone uh, as not only as a sort of professional mentor, but also as a friend and a family for me, and from my entire family. Uh, a bit of a personal sort of matter, but you know, I think I, I, sh I should bring this up. Uh, when I was in Colombo uh, for two years working with the UNDP Regional Center, so we were there together, you know, living together as family in a way. But he's not, he's no more, the, the fact that he is no more actually bothers me quite, quite a lot. And there are occasions when, uh, you know, we, we still see his smiling face and then, you know, start thinking, you know, what went wrong. Uh, and right now, as we are organizing this memorial, uh, someone's uh, son, Chandana, is watching us like, uh, I mean, information technology has made this possible. Um, and uh, one uh, additional point that I want to make is that, see, we have been blamed for being a talk shop, literally. Uh, you know, South Asia, uh, um, uh, economic summit that we organized, then we don't do the follow-up. Particularly this, for this session, I want to propose an idea. <clears throat> and this is something that I propose, thank you, Abid, for organizing um, a virtual memorial in which I could not participate, but I had, I had made this written contribution. Uh, I would like to propose to all of you, all the friends of someone, the institutional and personal friends of someone, that we is initiate uh, a, a fellowship program to honor uh, someone's contribution to, to the region. And, you know, we will contribute resources uh, personally or, uh, or institutionally and create a, corp create a corpus fund uh, that would then be used for uh, creating someone Kelegama fellowship on regional integration. This is my idea. If anybody wants to join this idea, Maybe I have I've not even discussed this with uh, Dushini. Maybe IPS would like to host this or, or any other organization would like to host it. That would be great. And this is, um, this is an action-oriented plan that I'm proposing. Uh, thank you very much. Thank you very much. <clears throat> when we are uh, remembering someone I would like to share with you two things which I was last discussing with him before his demise. First he wanted and he was discussing that how we can map out the policy implication of this size process with, with particularly policy angle. He, he was of the, in, in discussion with me that already we are now completing 10 years and what next and which, which are the policy options at, at the moment 
which we could influence to SAC or other regional thing. One thing. The second thing was the, uh, in 2005, Saman and Ratnaikar support, we have started South Asia Center for Economic Journalists. So he was uh, very keen that we should revive it also because the media is expanding role. And he has been very ki kind enough to participate our media training session in Bangkok. He never refuses us for any session on regional trade integration. So I think these were the two things I was last talking to him. And let's uh, take it forward because he wished these two things to forward. Thank you very much. Given the time constraints, can I just call on Nitya? I saw your hand going up and the ambassador here. And Paras, uh, and we'll wrap up after that. Well, um, I thought I will share um, uh, one of my discussions that I had with someone. And something he said, uh, which now is like prophetic. It was 2011, I was in, uh, in a conference in uh, Colombo. And that was not this kind of group, it was a different group. And I was an outlier in that group uh, because it's a so-called strategic group, you know, those political strategic group. And someone was also a kind of uh, outlier there. So essentially what happened then, two of us kind of spent most of the time uh, on the sidelines. So it, we're talking about uh, the Chinese investment that was happening, you know. Uh, so I asked him, what is your opinion about it? And he said, well, I'm not very impressed. Our politicians are very impressed that this is going to help us. But my feeling is that uh, we will get into trouble because of this. And when I saw this, and exactly, you know, uh, few days after uh, uh, I came to know about someone's death, I saw a kind of news report that, you know, Sri Lanka has got into trouble uh, in those airport, uh, sorry, airports and uh, Ambantutta seaports and all. So I was recalling that how prophetic his assessment was and I wish the political leadership would have given more uh, attention to what he tr was trying to say. Uh, so that I thought I should share with this audience. And I have one more suggestion like Ratnakar, but I think probably you have already uh, have discussed. I, I hope uh, IPS would institute a kind of someone's Kilagama Memorial Lecture in, in the institute, which some eminent person can be called every year, and that can be kind of, uh, you know. Yeah. Uh, thank, thank you, Nitya. Para, yeah. Thank you. Paras. Yeah, just a brief personal note from Sauti on Saman Kalegama. There are many ways in which we miss Dr. Kalegama, and one of which is his role as uh, a member of the advisory board of our magazine Trade Insight. Whenever we bumped into him in events and functions in different South Asian capitals, he almost invariably inquired about the, you know, the status of the magazine, when the next issue is coming, and what you know, themes you have in mind for the forthcoming issues. And that to us was a great you know, moral booster and you know, helped us you know, publish on a regular basis. We miss someone a lot. Thank you. Yes, um, Ambassador um, Salim, and I think that I saw one hand, and can we'll wrap up after that? Three hands. journal, you know. Uh, I also happen to be, I'm still <laughs> sort of one of the regional editors of South Asia Economic Journal. Very recently, during the visit of our president to Sri Lanka as a chief guest, um, concluding ceremony of UN Besak Day, I had hosted a dinner. And then a couple of persons I remember, someone was, of course, number one, and then a couple of professors from the University of Colombo. I talked to him. He voluntarily had already offered that he would also co-host uh, South Asia Economic Students Summit. Uh, Salim Rehan, Professor Salim Rehan, in collaboration with Saman with IPS, we are going to hold that uh, summit uh, in Colombo. I happen to be uh, the first chairman of the governing council of Sajen. You know, when I heard the news that Saman is dead, I couldn't believe, so I visited his house. And then first time I saw, 
Doshni was also there, I remember. And then I had with me the then Secretary General of Bimstek, uh, Sumit Nakandala. And then the way someone lied on the bed, I thought he would speak to me. And it was so sad, you know. So uh, we had been talking about a lot of collaborative works. And long time ago, I remember when we visited Sark Secretary General, he asked about Saudi. Uh, it was during 2004 or three, I, I forgot. And then the Secretary General showed his uh, innocence that he wouldn't know what is Saudi all about. So he said, it's a shame. And then I, you, should have, you, know, you, you should have some modesty, someone. You, should, you shouldn't have done that. So for six years, we traveled to all the countries in South Asia as one of the commissioners of Independent South Asian uh, uh, Poverty Elevation Commission. So someone was with us, I pay my tribute to him. So I thought, without you know, uh, recollecting my memories with someone, uh, which is almost two decades long, so I really would feel guilty, so I took your time. Sorry for that. Thank you very much. Uh, Selim, just behind you first, and then Selim can be the last one. Yeah, thanks. Uh, it was excellent, I think, uh, panel discussions. Uh, one of the, I think, uh, the point was one, economic integration was the barrier about the political differences. I feel that the best tribute to someone will be that why we should not set aside the political differences and we should promote the economic integration for the welfare of the, our people also. Thank you. Thank you very much. Salim. Uh, thank you. Actually, I have uh, so many personal memories and I don't really want to, you know, I know this time is short. But one thing I'd really like to mention that uh, uh, relatively, I'm a newcomer in South Asia on the regional integration issues because when I got my PhD in 2005, and then when I got introduced to Dr. Kelegama, I think I remember that he, uh, you know, he just uh, took me like as a kind of a new generation of, and then uh, and uh, my fellows uh, who are there in South Asia, the kind of relatively younger generation, he always kind of conveyed the message that you have to carry this agenda forward. Uh, I really believe in that way, and actually, I, I, I think that that was the kind of inspiration I got from him. I was actually working with him until uh, very recently when he died, uh, left us uh, on ETCA, uh, on the India Sri Lanka uh, study. Uh, and I had a regular communication with him on Viva, on WhatsApp. Uh, I, I, I just, I would conclude with, by saying that he was truly a South Asian. Every time, uh, just on a kind of uh, light note, every time uh, Bangladesh beat Sri Lanka, he was the first person to congratulate me, sending message that congratulations to Bangladesh, Bangladesh beat Sri Lanka. Thank you. In, in Thank cricket, you, actually. Uh, and with that, I think I also just want to extend um, our thanks on behalf of the IPS to our um, partners in South Asia. I know many memorial services were held and many more are also um, being planned in the coming months. We truly appreciate um, the sentiments that have been ex uh, expressed and extended, not only to us, but I'm sure it is also well appreciated by his family as well. We will pass on the messages from this um, session uh, to Mrs. Kalegama and um, someone's two children. Uh, and we will do everything that we can at the IPS to ensure that his leadership, commitment, and vision um, to the cause of um, economic integration in South Asia is kept alive. And we also have a series of um, programs that we have planned to ensure that his memory is kept alive and his legacy also lives on. So with that, I would like to close this session. I thank the four panelists, Mustafiz, Nagesh, Posh, and Abid, um, and Sorti once again for um, organizing this um, special session to honor uh, someone's memory. Thank you very much. Thank you, Chair, thank you, speakers, and thank you, audience, for making this special session in memory and honor of Saman Kelegama, a truly special one. Uh, before we conclude this session, I would like to request Honorable Dr. Govindaraj Vatta, 
uh, member at M National Planning Commission to please uh, present our speakers uh, with tokens of appreciation. I request Dr. Dusni Wirakun to please come forward and receive her token of appreciation. I request Professor, uh, I request Dr. Nagesh Kumar to please uh, receive his token of appreciation. Now I request Professor Mustafizur Rahman to please uh, receive his token of appreciation. Now I would like to request Dr. Abid Kalyum Suleri to receive his token of appreciation. Lastly, I request Dr. Postras Pandey to receive his token of appreciation. We would like to thank you all once again. We would like to thank you all once again for uh, participating in this session, and we will be back soon with the closing session. Thank you.